Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the next lecture. Today we'll cover another round of mixed language programming. In particular, I will talk about SWIC. I will mention instant and C-type. But before we start, I would like to mention that in case you have troubles installing Python with NumPy and, and Cython and SWIC, what I recommend you, so in particular, this is the case if you work on the EFI machines, because they, as far as I know, only have Python 2 installed or Python 3 only partly installed. So what you can do is you can have an entire Python installation in your local home directory with all the dependencies that you need. And the way you do that is by installing this Anaconda. So if you Google for Anaconda, then you come to this page and you basically can download Anaconda for different operating systems. And Anaconda is a distribution, a Python distribution that comes with various de different uh, packages straight away. So you basically install it and you have everything you need to do everything uh, in this course. And so it's quite a big installation file here, 450 55 megabytes. But it's basically you type in this command after you've downloaded it, you type in this command down here and run it and it will install it in your home directory and it will set it up so that we, when you open up U-Terminal, it will automatically use this Anaconda Python installation. So that should it make it really easy to get started also on EFI machines. And the great thing is you basically you just, you can delete this local folder that was created by Anaconda and then you remove the installation again. So it's, it's quite, should be quite easy to set up. Mm, okay, what? I wanted to mention something else. Yes, so then regarding assignment three. So in assignment three, you first create a Python implementation and then you switch to NumPy, right? And so you could obviously just keep the loops. Um, you, in Python, you will have a loop and for the assignment three when you create this model put set. You, keep, you could keep this loop in, in NumPy as well, but you won't get much speed up. If you use NumPy, you get only get speed up if you also make use of vectorization. So if you want to make vectorization, if you're not quite um, familiar with it yet, there's a, a Piazza thread called vectorizing matrix that demonstrates how vectorization works with NumPy. So that's what I, yeah, I recommend you to read up on this. Okay, otherwise, um, yeah. I will give you a quick preview on what we will do in the next lectures, but I'll do that later. Okay, any questions so far? No? Then let's start with the next mixed language programming in Python. So today we'll talk about SWIC. And so before we start, here's just a comparison between why it is so complicated to interface Python and C. And here's one of the complications. So in, in Python, when, you, when we create variables, these variables can hold different objects, right? So we can create a variable D that first contains a float. And then later on in the program, we can change D so that it uh, holds a, text, a string. And then later on, maybe we even change D so that it contains an, an a class object, in this case a button. So this is how Python works. In C it's different. So in, in C, but also C++ and Fortran, when we use a variable, we always have to specify which type this variable is, and then later on we can't change the type anymore. So here, for example, we declared a double D, and then we can set the value of the double D, but we can't set it to a string anymore. Right? So this is an illegal operation down here. Because on the left-hand side, we have a double. On the right-hand side, we have a string. So that the compiler will complain here. And so this is one of the differences that sometimes makes it complicated to interface C, C++, and Fortran uh, from Python. And this is why we're talking about all these interface tools. 
So today, we will talk a little bit about C and also C++. If you're not familiar with it, it should still be okay to follow the lecture today, but if you want to learn more about C, I created this C tutorial here. This is a link. If you click on it, you will get, I think it's a, a few pages a PDF file that you can download and just get a quick introduction to C. Okay, so here's what you're going to learn today. So first, I will show you how you can call C from Python, and I will show you the hard way, so doing everything manually. And so after we've done it the hard way, I will show you how we can actually automate things and hopefully get, make it a lot easier. And for that, we will use SWIG. So first, I will show you how you can use SWIG with, Py with C to do Python C integration, then SWIG with C++, and then finally, I'll also show you how we can use SWIG with NumPy, NumPy arrays. But let's start with the hard way. Okay. Let's say we have a C function. And so this might be a function that we have implemented ourselves. It might be coming from an external library that we want to connect to Python. And this is what it looks like. So forget it. You can ignore this X turn here. So basically, this is the function name, hwm1. These are the input arguments. So it takes one double, and it takes a second double. And this is the return value. So our function takes in two doubles, and it returns a double. And so we would like to interface the C function now that we can use it from Python. So ideally, we would want to write from some kind of module, import our function here. Then we create two floating point values, just like the doubles here. And then we call hw1, pass in these two floating point numbers, and get the return value here. Okay, this is our goal. So in Python, when we create these variables here, these are floating point values. While in C, we're talking about doubles. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to um, take the floating point values, R1 and R2, convert them into doubles so that they're compatible with C. Then, so we take these, convert these into doubles. Then we can call the original C function, get the return value as a double, and convert the double value again is into a Python float object, and then, we t and then um, that will be our result S. So basically, we need to convert between the C data types and the Python data types. And this conversion is going to be done in wrapper code. So this wrapper code basically allows us to um, so Python comes with functionality that allows us to write this wrapper, uh, wrapper code in, in C. And so Python is actually written in C, and any, every object that we're talking about in Python is, from a C perspective, it's a Py object. So every, every Python object is actually wrapped in, as a Py object. And so what our web code will now do, it will take the pi object and extract out the underlying C objects. So in this case, we will have a pi object R1, and we will extract the underlying double. And we will have a pi object R2, and we will also extract the underlying double. And so we will now write this web code. It will be a C function, and it will do all this conversion for us, and then we can compile this wrapper code, and once it's compiled, it will be a, we will, can use it as a Python module, just as if you had coded a normal uh, module in Python. So here's what the wrapper code looks like for our HW function. So this is now C code that does all the conversion. So the first thing that we do is we need to um, include the Python functionality into C. We do this with this include statement. And we need to include 
the C function that we have implemented. So here I've stored it into in the file source slash hw.h. So this is my normal C implementation that I've implemented before. And so the rest of the code now, this is our this is the wrapping fu wrapper function. So as you can see, the, uh, this is just the name of the wrapper function. It's called underscore wrap h underscore hw1. And so it takes in a self pi object and it takes an a arcs pi object. And so basically what will this will be, so remember everything in Python is an object, even a function. And so the first argument here is always the function itself. And then the second argument here, this is all the arguments that are, that is being passed into the functions. And so our Python functions takes in two arguments. So this pi object here will actually be a tuple of two Python floats, one containing R1 and the second one containing R2. And our function returns a pi object again, and we want HW1 to return a float again. So we will need to, this pi, pi object will contain a floating point value. Okay, so how do we convert? So we have this arcs, the, the um, Python gives us this arcs thing here, and we know that's a tuple with two elements. So we need to convert these into the two double, uh, double um, variables in C. So the first thing that we do is we create two doubles, um, one containing R1 and one R2, and we actually create also a third one where we can store in the results. And then this, this line here, this is where the conversion happens. So this Python provide, provides us with a function pi arc pass tuple. And what that does is it takes in a pi object, in this case it's our argument, and it converts, in, it converts the tuple into the individual components of the tuple. And so we need to specify which type of tuple we expect, and this is what we do here with this string. So we expect that our double, double consists, our tuple consists of two doubles, and this is what these two D here stands for, okay? And then this is just uh, a name in a name of the mo module in case of error messages. But so the important part is here. So basically, this line here takes in this general pi object mm, variable and converts it or extract the two double values out. Okay, so this is the first part of the conversion. And so now we have the two double values, and now we can just call our hw1 function. This is our normal c function, and we will store the result into this um, result variable here. So in c, rather than using ret return value, we can pass in a variable as a reference, and it will actually change this, the, the value of this um, variable here. So after this line, so here we're just calling our C function, and after this line, this result variable will contain the result of this function. And so the last step that we need to do is we need to convert back the result double into a Python object. And in this case, we will, we will use the pi float form double function that again Python provides us with. So it takes us a double, it takes in a double, and it re returns a pi float. Python object that contains a float. So you can see I pass in the result. Here. And the result is this resulting object, which if you look up here, is of type pi object. And so we can just return it. So overall the structure again is we wrote a wrapper code that takes in, that purely operates on pi objects. And our implementation converts these pi objects into C variables, in this case it's doubles, then it calls the C function, and then it converts back the C objects into pi objects and returns it. Okay? So, once we have this, once we have written this wrapper function, we can compile it and link it. And what we will get is a so-called shared library. And this shared library can be loaded in is a, in Python just if it was a normal module. And in general, these module or these um, kind of modules 
that come in as shared libraries, they're also called extension modules. And so I would like to show you a demo how this works. Mm, so here we have, let's see. So here's my implementation, my normal C implementation that of my HWC function. So can you see this okay? Yeah. So my HW1 function takes in these two doubles and operates on the third double. This would be the output value. And it just computes the sinus of the sum. Of it takes the sum of the two input variables, takes the sinus, and stores, stores the result in the output variable. And if I look at the header file, this is exactly what I've shown you in, in the slides before. So it's our normal function that takes into doubles and has the last double as a return value. And so now my wrapper code is up here. Oops. This is the wrapper code that I discussed. Right? I just uh, went through it line by line. And so now I can compile it. And I've, I have some compilation steps here. The, I will show you they're all available online. And after I've compiled it, I now have this hw.so HW file. And this is, this is this module file that you can now load in. So if I go into IPython, so remember that, so if you look, there's no hw.py file. There's just an aw.so file. But if I open up IPython, I can type in H, import hw, and this hw will also have an hw1 function. And I can call it with two floating point values and get the result as expected. Okay? Yeah. But as you can imagine, so doing this is quite tedious, right? So even for the very simple function just now, there was a lot of detail and there was a lot of conversion that we had to take care of. We didn't even worry about error handling. So in general, writing this wrapper code by hand is, is quite tedious and error prone. Imagine if you need to interface a large li library that someone else has written that might consist of hundreds of functions that you now need to interface. And even worse, this might be updated on a daily basis, right? And you need to you spend your entire time just um, writing wrapper code. So really, what we need to do is we need to automate it, right? Ideally, we want to have a tool that, given some C function, just spits out this wrapper code, and then we can just compile it. And such a tool exists, and there are actually multiple of these, but I will show you SWIG, which works for C uh, and C++. So SWIG stands for Simplified Wrapper and Interface Generation. Right? So it's generating our wrapper code, basically. And SWIG is quite a complex, um, quite a complex software framework, and I will only show you kind of a minimal version of it, just so that you get a feeling on what it can do. And in general, like with all the frameworks that I'm presenting, I have code snippets available on GitHub. So if you go to GitHub and you go to the your UIO inf3331 page, you should see a repository that is called code snippets. And this code snippets contains one directory called mixed. And in here, you find implementations of various different integration tools. So here's the one with the C API that I've just shown you. So this is the one that I've where I coded up, up, up everything by hand. Then we have a Cython example here. We have a Cython example that works with NumPy. And then we also have a SWIG example down here. 
right? So here we have one example with C and actually one with C++. So this is, a, if you want to code something yourself, this might be a good starting point. OK, so let's go back. And let's imagine now we have, um, we have written a Python module, the scientific hello world Python module that consists of two function, hw1 and hw2. The difference between the two is that the first one computes the, the sum of the two arguments, then its sinus, and then returns the result, while the second one just prints out the result without returning anything. But otherwise, they are the same. OK, and so the way we can use that is we import this module, and we call hw1 and store the result as s, or we just call wh2 and get the result printed out. So now we want to impl implement this in C and C++ and use it just if it was a pure Python function. In this case, and also we don't want to write any wrapper code. So this should now mm, happen automatically. So for generating the wrapper code, we will use SWIG. And basically, we will have to do three steps. So using SWIG is a bit more complicated than Cython. It consists of uh, three steps. So after we've created the C implementation, so that's obviously the very first step that we need to do. After we've done that, we need to create a so-called SWIG interface file. And this SWIG interface file basically just specifies which parts of the program should be automatically interfaced to Python. Once we've done this, we will, call, we will run the SWIG tool. And the SWIG tool will then generate these interface files for us. And finally, we will compile and link these wrapper codes and the C code. And we will obtain our modules, our Python modules that we can then use. So let's start with the first step. So first, we need to implement HW1 and HW2. So we create a header file where we just specify the inputs and outputs of these functions. So our HW1 file, remember, it took, it took in two variables and outputted a third one. So the third one I will just, again, return as a, as a pointer here. And then the second, argument, the second function takes in two, two doubles and just prints out the result. So there's no third argument here, no return argument here. And the implementation is shown down here. So the first one is pretty straight. Yeah, the first one just uh, calls exactly what, you, what we're expecting, and that stores the result in this s variable. And the second one is also quite similar to Python, actually, just that we use the print statement here to print out the result. So these are our C implementations. We stored them both in, the, in a directory called source. So it's called source hwh and source hw.c. So after we've done that, we need to implement the SWIG interface file. And this file is, you typically call it with an ending .i. So here I called it hw.i. And it's just a few lines long. And it basically contains all the information that SWIG needs to generate this web, the web record. So the first line, in the first line, you specify the name of the module that you want, that you want to use. So you typically write from HW import HW1. Right? And so the module name you spec specify up here. In the next line of code, here you here you need to copy and paste, or here you need to insert all the functions in, that you need to wrap. So you need to actually insert the, the C implementation in this, in this section here. And because I don't want to copy and paste it, I just used an include statement. So the include statement just includes a file into this section here. So basically, with this include statement, I, I include the implementation of my HW 
functions in this area in this year. And the reason why you need to do this is because this part is actually the part that is going to be compiled and that is part of the, of the shared module. Okay, and so, so the here this is basically the implementation, the C implementation that, we, that we're going to use. And then the remaining part of the SWIG interface file just lists the functions that we want to have interfaced, and that's all. So basically here, I just state, okay, I want to interface the HW1 function, it takes in these arguments, and I want to interface the H2 function, and it takes in these arguments. If you don't want to list these functions explicitly, you can also just use the keyword dollar include source HW1. And by doing that, it will just automatically interface all the functions that are part of your, of your implementation. Okay? So that's it. And so once you've done this, you can now run the SWIG tool to generate these wrapper codes. So the way you do that is you call SWIG minus Python. So here we tell SWIG that we actually in, we are, that we're interested in, in Python wrapper code. SWIG also supports various other uh, scripting languages, but here we're only interested in the Python implementation, in the Python wrapper code. So the reason why this is interested is imagine you're implementing or you're developing a big library and you want your users to be able to access this library from Python, but maybe also from MATLAB or from JavaScript or I don't know what. And so potentially you can just replace this keyword have with your own scripting languages and then automatically have an interface for another scripting language. And then you just specify an include uh, directory here, so I have all my implementations in, in the source directory, so I need to add this flag here, and the interface file that I've created. And so once I've done this, the output in my file system, I will have a new file called hwweb.c, and that's the automatically generated wrapper code. And this basically contains, it's a very bloated up version of the manual coded one that I've showed at the beginning of the lecture with various error handling and so on. And so when, once we've done this, we can compile and link it. So here's my compiled statement that I used. It will be different for yours, but it's not that important. So basically we're just compiling it and then linking it and the result will be again um, such an underscore hw.so file that will be um, that will be our shared object that we can just load in as a Python module. Okay, so we could write a simple build script. So how would a simple build script look like? We store it as a shell script, for example, build.sh, and it just contains all the steps that are required to compile, to generate the wrapper, the wrapper code with the SWIG command up here to compile the wrapper code. And at the end, I also added a simple test statement where we import the generated module just to check that everything works. So once I've done this, all I need to do is, if I change my C implementation, all I need to do is run this build script again and it will automatically compile it, it will automatically generate the wrapper code, um, automatically produce the module file, and I can use the updated implementation also from Python. And so this even works if I change the interface to my programs. So if I add new arguments to my programs, um, I might have to change the interface file, but I might also have not to. So if you look back to the interface file, if I use this automatic including of all the functions down here, then I, on a, then I can leave out this part, and then it, there's actually nothing function specific in this interface file. So there's no, I don't say anywhere which arguments are being used in which way. So which means that if I actually change, if I add additional arguments to my HW functions, I don't need to edit the interface file. Okay, 
So the problem with these build files is that they are not very robust. Um, so nowadays, rather than building up your own build script, a much better way is uh, to use distutils. And so you've used this before. And the way, the way you build distutils files is to create a setup.py file. Um, and it's, it basically always looks the same. It's written down here. The only difference that we need to change is that you specify the name of your module here, potentially a version. If you want to have different versions and um, it can automatically detect that you need to upgrade your version, for example. And then you call the setup file. And in the setup file, you specify the most important part is where you specify the interface file, so the hw.i, and the source files that you need to compile, right? And potentially some include directories. But so the setup.py file will automatically detect that there's a SWIG interface file and will compile it for you automatically. It will automatically figure out which um, compilation um, options it's ne it needs to use to compile it. So basically, once you've added such a setup.py file in your, um, in your path, then all you need to do is call python setup.py build ext. So this will now compile and generate, uh, generate the speaker tools and compile it. And then you can install it. And in this case, I just installed it in my current directory. So after this line here, the module will be available in my directory in which I'm working in. So now I've simplified the build script and just removed all these compiler flags and so on that I hadn't had to use before. Any questions? Okay, so after compilation, I can then test it again to see if, if the import actually worked. So also note, so with setup.py, by default here, you just install it our current directory. But basically, you can install it to any kind of directory. Your modules, your modules can always be installed in any arbitrary directory, and it, Python can load it as long as it's in your Python path. So the Python path is an environmental, environment variable that Python checks um, when it looks for modules. OK, so let's test our implementation. So rem remember our hw1 function took in two arguments and returned the, f the re updated the third variable internally. And so now mm, when we call, when, when we compiled our module and we import our function, what OK, when we first look at these arguments, the obvious thing to do is to just create three floats, right? One for each. C in C, we have doubles. and Python, we have floats. So we just create three floats. And then we call hw1. But then actually, the, what we will get is an error. It will tell us something like type error in method hw1, argument three of type double star. And so if you look up here, so this, is a, this double star comes up here. While here, we just pass in a normal float. So apparently, the double star is not compatible with the float that we pass in here. But if you think it about again, this is actually not the way we want to call hw1 anyway, because the s should be a re return value. So ideally, we would want to write s equals w hw1 r1 r2. So this function doesn't quite work yet, as we expect it to. Oops. OK, and so what we are missing is we need to tell SWIG which arguments in our C functions are input and output arguments. And the way we do that is by using so-called type maps. So, type, so now we need to edit our interface file. And what we add is we add this, we include this type maps.i.i extension. And once we have that, we can, where we specify our functions, we can now say, OK, wr1, wr2, this is just the normal ones. But then the last one, w star, and here we will use the key, keyword output. And when we do that, then the SWIG generator 
file will automatically know that Py this should be a Python output, right? And so it will actually remove it from the, from the Python inputs and rather move it as an output. So now after we recompiled and regenerated this wicker code and recompiled, then we can use the function in Python as we expect it to. So we can just write s equals hw1 r1 r2. Okay? Okay, so there's various other tools that also support C++. Some are, show, some are listed here. So there's boost.python, there's pi.cxx, and there's instant and Cython, which I will talk about later. Um, maybe the, the, the big advantage that Swig has, or maybe the only advantage that Swig has, is that it automatically generates these um, these wrapper codes. So SWIG is mostly used if you have big, large projects with big APIs that where you know that the AI APIs change on a regular basis. So basically where you want to avoid sitting down all the time and updating mm, your Cython wrapping tool or, uh, yeah. Also SWIG generates, generates interfaces to other scripting languages. So if you're interested, and if you have a, a C++ library and you want to support various different scripting languages, then SWIG might be the tool to use. So because there's so many tools out there and because it can be a bit confusing to which one to use, I created this decision tree. So this will hopefully help you given, given a specific problem that you have to decide which tool you might want to use. And so basically the way it works is that you start on the top and you just work your way down and you end up at a potentially useful tool. So let's see. So the first question that you need to answer is, do you want to integrate an existing library? Okay. So let's say we don't have an existing library, so we go to the right. And so the first step that we do is we implement it in Python. And then if it's fast enough, then we just use Python. Then, then we're done. Okay, but if it's not fast enough, then the next thing we can try is NumPy with vectorization. Okay, so this is what you do in the exercise, so that's the first logical step afterwards. If this still doesn't work, we can use Cython, which you also try in your exercise. And there's also other tools like PyPy and Numba that you can try. Okay, so we've tried all this and it's still too slow. So then the next step is to actually re-implement it in C, C++, and Fortran. So maybe we can increase the, maybe we have some slow loops that we need to speed up. And so, yeah, so we sit down and re-implement it in Fortran. And so now we have a library. And this library now can be written in different languages. And so depending on the language in which you've written it in, you can do, use different tools. So if you have Fortran, there's a tool called f.py might be quite hard to read this. Make this a bit bigger. So it's called f.py. If you have C, you can use Cython, C types, and inst or instant. If you use C++, then you can use Cython, Py, Py CXX, or boost.python, which I mentioned before. Or the last one, if you have a big project where you, the API changes a lot, then you can use this SWIG to automatically generate your, your files. And then let's go to the top again. So the last decision that we had, so imagine we actually do have an existing library that we need to, that we want to integrate. Then we need to ask ourselves, okay, do we want to support other scripting languages than Python? In case we do, then probably SWIG is a good option. In case we don't want to support other ones, then we can go back to our the case down here where we just differentiate between the different mm, programming languages. Okay, any, any questions regarding the decision tree? So basically the message is there's, there's no, the reason why there's so many is because there's no tool that just fits the bill for everything, right? So it really depends on, on your 
on your tasks that you have and also on your preferences. So if you ask different people, they will all have different opinions on which tool might be the best. <laughs>